Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. Hope you're all keeping safe and well and had a lovely Easter. And hello to the people who are new here as well. I've had a few comments from people who have found me for the first time recently, which is lovely. You're very welcome. Your comments have been very kind, so thank you. Um, this is another of my monthly roundup videos I like to do, and this is an out and about special because there are no less than six things I've done in London this past month I want to talk about. You know, I've been out for walks and things as well, but there are six kind of special things I've done. Um, there are two big theatre shows I've seen, two stand-up comedy shows I've been to, and then two free restaurant meals I've had as well, one of which was a very novel and unusual and fun experience. Um, so there's plenty to get through here. As always, there's a lot more detail in the blog post to go with this. And all opinions of my own as always, even though um, the restaurant meals I'm going to mention were both PR freebies um, with my uh, work colleague Emily for her to review, um, all opinions of my own regardless. So yeah, there's quite a bit to get through here and there's nothing to mention particularly on the TV front, that's why I'm not going to do a section on that. Um, but yeah, there'll be plenty to mention on that front in April because there's various bits and pieces I want to watch either on TV, online or on DVD or whatever. Um, so yeah, this is just an out and about special focusing on the things I've been doing in London lately because it's been quite a busy and fun month. So Let's crack on with it, and I hope you enjoy. So, starting off the theatre shows, and the big one for me this month was Just For One Day at the Old Vic Theatre, which has just finished its two-month run there, and I saw the audio described performance with a touch tour as well, and it was really good. This was all about the Live Aid event back in 1985 that was, of course, raising money for the victims of the famine in Ethiopia with those two huge concerts, one in Wembley Stadium in London, one in JFK Stadium in Philadelphia. I mean, everyone kind of knows about it, I think. If you don't, then do go and check it out online. I have recently posted a great big post all about it in my blog, going through it in depth. You know, I was too young to go and see the event at the time. I was only a toddler when it was held. So, you know, I only got to really experience it in some way when the DVD came out in 2004. Even that wasn't complete, but there was a lot on there. So um, I've rewatched that recently and watched a lot of online videos to fill in the gaps and look at extra things as well. So there's a huge blog post all about Live Aid. Queen were amazing, U2, David Bowie and all sorts of other acts. It was a huge deal and a very impressive achievement, especially for the time. So, yeah, it's been lovely. There's a musical celebrating it. It's backed by Bob Geldof as well. He was heavily involved. He has given it his nod, his approval. And so the Band Aid Trust, for whom some of the ticket sales proceeds have gone to as well, which is lovely. So yeah, it's a really good musical. It follows basically Bob Geldof's journey in developing the Band Aid single, how that came about, Do They Know It's Christmas, and then how things evolved from there to putting on the Live Aid concerts and all the challenges of putting those together. It's basically told in a way that Bob Geldof is talking to the new generation about it. So there's a lady who was at the Live Aid concert who compels Bob to tell one of her young friends about it to try and inspire the new generation to kind of take the whole movement forward you know to bring action against poverty you know persuade governments to do things find long-term solutions that kind of thing so Bob's reluctant at first but then he does kind of relate the story and you kind of you know revisit all the different times and the people who are involved in stuff and then the various songs from Live Aid are incorporated along the way very effectively and they're not trying to impersonate any of the artists they're not trying to replicate the performances or the songs themselves either you know they've put their own theatrical spin on all the different songs but in a great way so you know, things like Blowing in the Wind, for example, you know, I'm not really a fan of Bob Dylan's version particularly. I'm not a huge Dylan fan, but the way they've done it in this show is wonderful. There's several Queen songs in there, of course, and there's obviously Bob Geldof's song, I Don't Like Mondays, which was obviously iconic at the time, and all sorts of other big songs from the event. It's really nice the way they've kind of incorporated the songs and performed them and everything. And yeah, it was just really good fun, you know, moving in parts, humorous in others. They weren't kind of losing sight of the message. You know, it was very clear what this was about, you know, the sort of people that need the help. So... Yeah, it was a really good musical, really nice way of celebrating it. And the Touch Tour was really well organised. There was a lot of us there. You know, there's a big group from the um, social group I Matter, and then there was various other people like myself there. And uh, Roz Chalmers was the lead audio describer, and there was another of our colleagues there as well. They sort of helped us all out. And yeah, it was really well organised. They split the group into two, basically. So half went on the stage and looked at some mixing desks and a record shop set and things like that. And then the rest kind of sat down in the stalls looking at props and costumes that were handed around. And then we swapped over. So we all got to see everything which was uh, really nice and then the audio description was really good as well they didn't do any ad during the songs themselves because they were so loud you wouldn't be able to hear it clearly but they did kind of fill you in on any important things immediately afterwards so yeah it all worked out very nicely they gave us all the detail we needed to be able to follow along so yeah, it's a very enjoyable and entertaining show and if it ever pops up again at the old vic or anywhere else i do highly recommend going to see it because it's very good and then the other play I saw this month, at the end of the month, in fact, was Nye at the National Theatre, at their Olivia Theatre, to be precise. And this was, again, with a touch tour and audio description, which were very useful. Again, the touch tour had a big group of us, but they organised it very nicely, so we all got a chance to move around and see everything. 
And yeah, the play is all about Nye Bevan, who famously set up the National Health Service in the UK against much opposition as well. You know, he had to force it not just past the politicians who were against it, but also the doctors as well. So yeah, it took a lot of effort on his part. And this play kind of tells his life story in a very engaging way, you know, from his childhood when he struggled at school with the way he stammered and his confidence and things, and then moved into mining. And then from there kind of got into politics and used kind of some ideas kind of from his mining days to kind of push this idea of a National Health Service forward, you know, where people pay in through their taxes and things but then everyone can access the National Health Service for free and get healthcare irrespective of their ability to pay for it so it was very important what he did and obviously it's been a huge success story since obviously they're struggling as well you know there's issues with funding and resources and things but the people in the NHS are amazing always have been always will be so yeah it's a really interesting and engaging look at his life I didn't know much about him before so yeah it was nice to get that kind of insight Michael Sheen plays him fantastically I mean I love Michael Sheen and staged and good omens that kind of thing so I knew he'd be great in this and he was he really gets the emotion across you know whether it's humor there's some of that in there too and whether it's a drama and when he's kind of more scared about things as well and it's all told kind of via his hospital bed basically where he's dying towards the end of his life you know he's drugged up to the eyeballs on morphine so he's unconscious a lot of the time and he's having these kind of hallucinations and recollections about his past life so we go through his life that way which is a good way of doing it and we kind of keep coming back to kind of his deathbed when you know his wife and a friend of his are there you know wondering whether to tell him whether he's going to die or whether it's best to kind of just let him live comfortably and ignorant until it actually kind of comes about. So there's some very moving kind of moments, as you can imagine, in there, especially at the end of the show. Not just that, but the whole hospital set as well adapts to the different locations. So you've kind of got the beds on each side and the curtains and things, but then they all move around to kind of form different you know, scenes and everything. So the beds flip on their sides to create desks and the curtains kind of move about in different formations, you know, even coming down in different levels, you know, to represent the House of Commons with their green seats. You know, the green colour of the curtains is ideal for that and things like that. So it's really clever staged and you know the story is really nicely told as well there's even a musical number in there at one point which may sound inappropriate but it's actually very well placed very good and good fun so yeah as I say there are light-hearted moments in there but obviously the issues at the heart of it are very serious and it really gives you a greater appreciation for the sheer effort and determination that Nye Bevan had to kind of get the NHS set up and you're reminded at the very end of the show with the caption just you know what difference the NHS has made so yeah it was uh, interesting enlightening funny moving you know it was everything you'd want a theatre show to be in terms of taking you on this kind of ride of emotions and helping you learn something at the same time so I highly recommend going to see it um, it's on until May at the National Theatre and it's also been screened as part of National Theatre Live around the country as well so if you get a chance to catch it I do highly recommend it if you like Michael Sheen anyway then you'll like him in this but yeah very happy with that Touched All was also very good very well organised the staff were really friendly um, really helpful which is nice um, big shout out to Lawrence in particular who may well be watching this or reading my blog post because I gave him my uh, blog address so hello Lawrence if you're uh, watching this but yeah um, thank you to everyone at the National Theatre for their help because it's the first time I've been to a show in there actually since I've been to London which sounds really odd but you know I've had a backstage tour there but actually going there for a show has been something that's kind of eluded me for a while I don't know why there's been no reason for it particularly but yeah finally got around to going there and it was worth it it was a very good show so then we come on to stand-up comedy shows and the first one I want to mention this month is Sarah Millican now I saw her on her previous tour at the Hammersmith Apollo a couple of years ago and I've been back to the same venue again this year to see her on her current tour which is called Late Bloomer and she's very funny again as per usual as you'd expect so basically in this show she compares her experiences as a child to her current life as a 48 year old to figure out how she got to where she is today and how much she's changed in that time so lots of material about her childhood as well as more recent times as an adult which is a nice mixture there and she kind of laid out some criteria to see if you consider yourself an eager beaver or a late bloomer I'm definitely a late bloomer like her and absolutely nothing wrong with that and she's still touring the show around the UK for the rest of the year so I'm not going to give too much away but some of the highlights for me included her routines about items she carries in her bag a flotation tank experience her old school reports and her school bully who she talks about underwear and periods and dick pics and things like that and getting a new mobile phone and also the channel 4 show called open house so it just kind of gives you an idea of the variety of the kind of uh, things that she talks about and it's also well worth noting that for this particular performance she happened to have a bsl interpreter there as well which was fantastic there were some seats reserved for deaf patrons so they could get a good view of the uh, sign language interpreter who is Catherine king who i've also seen on the adam hills dvds that i've got so that was really nice that she was able to be in 
inclusive there. You know, Sarah is also very inclusive on social media for visually impaired people because she always describes her images, which is fantastic. So it's great that she's kind of tried to make her shows as inclusive as possible. And at the end of the show, we were also able to donate a bit to the Samaritans as well. They had some volunteers there and the money we donated to them goes to help people in the local area. So another example of how Sarah likes to make sure other people are supported. So yeah, it was great to see her again, basically. I mean, I may well go to another of her tours in the future. I probably won't go to everyone. I can't go to every single show by every single comedian that I like, but I'm glad I've been to see her a couple of times now. So yeah, I'll certainly try and go to see her again at some stage in a future tour. And then the other comedian I saw this month was Ross Noble at the London Palladium. And this was one of the last few shows on his 21st stand-up tour, unbelievably, called Jibber Jabber Jamboree. And I've been wanting to see him for a long time. It's always been difficult to kind of find the time to see him or get tickets or whatever. But I've enjoyed his shows on DVD and online in the past. He's amazing. And so I'm really glad I finally got to see him. Had a front row seat as well. Didn't get talked to, got away with that. But um, I would have been perfectly happy for him to talk to me, knowing what he's like, because all of his shows are improvised, um, which is really, really impressive. You know, he'll talk to people in the audience or make observations and things, and he'll kind of really kind of riff on them and go on tangents and then tangents off of tangents and tangents off of those in all sorts of weird and wonderful directions and still be able to circle back around to things he was talking about previously, you know, and he remembers people's names and things that he's seen and things that he's talked about and things like that. He's really, really clever I mean I'm sure he has jokes in the bank as well we certainly got anecdotes in mind that he kind of brings out if and when he feels they're appropriate and he probably has little gags in mind as well that he likes to bring out but basically no two shows of his have ever remotely the same so yeah it's really fun to kind of watch him in action he's really really good it also means the shows are really random as well so I mean there's no rhyme or reason if you try and read things back it's very much a you had to be there type of experience you know so I can't claim that anything I'm about to say that he talks about is going to make the remotest bit of sense but yeah as I say I didn't get spoken to in the front row but there are a couple of other people in the front row who Ross did get happily occupied with and got a lot of kind of inspiration from uh, one was a woman with an assistance dog at the other end of the central row of seats where I was sat and then across the aisle from me was a guy with a backpack as well and that proved to be quite good value to Ross as well especially when a man appeared in the seat instead of a backpack after the interval so that in itself spurred off extra material and the reason that the man moved was quite funny because he'd been sat behind a guy with a massive head so he decided to go and move to this free seat so there are little things like that going on and then among his other various different flights of fancy Ross spoke about animals like sheep cockatoos ferrets a hawk and slugs he also spoke about King Charles being in hospital, so obviously let's hope that King Charles does get well soon. And indeed Kate Middleton as well, of course. She's been very big news this uh, past month, and now that everything's kind of come out, let's hope the family do get privacy and everything, because, you know, all the kind of furore around her was all nonsense anyway. So let's just hope now that they can kind of get the space they need to just get through all this stuff, and obviously we wish them all the best. Um, there's a nice nod to Paul O'Grady. Um, it's hard to believe it's a year since he passed away. There was also an embarrassing story involving Ross's electric razor in a lift. Um, there was a joke on the school run he did that upset his wife. There was an interesting interpretation of the hymn Kumbaya that he had a, a sting in a couple of new verses too, which uh, were quite interesting and fun. There was also the game Guess Who. There was the Ghostbusters song that he got involved in one routine, which is quite topical as there's a new Ghostbusters film out. And a myriad of other things as well. Um, so, yeah, it was quite a variety, as you can imagine. As I say, I've seen that shows that he's released on DVD. I've got all those. I'm going to be reviewing those in my blog and shows that I've watched of his online as well. At a later date, obviously, there's quite a lot of those. So it'll take me a while to put that post together. But, yeah, it's nice starting to go through those shows again already, as I say, because every show is different. You know, even within a DVD set, he puts multiple shows on some of them. And they're all different. It's variety of humour. It's just great. It's just so clever how he improvises. And even if he is struggling, he doesn't show it. You know, he's just got that manner he's very good at engaging with the audience and we're just all with him all the way whatever direction he goes he's not to everyone's taste i'm sure but i just think he's brilliant he's really really clever so then finally moving on to restaurants and there are a few meals i went out and had this month uh, one of which i'm not going to bother talking about because it was kind of a private catch-up between me and a friend for their birthday and um, we had a nice meal at bill's that's all i need to say so um yeah we had a lovely evening together they know who they are um, but the other two meals i want to talk about were freebies thanks to my friend emily davison from fashion Eister, who i work with in her journalism role as a support worker as I've written about before in my blog and I was very privileged to go to a couple of meals for this month the first of which was very unusual this was at Cinnamon Kitchen uh, near Liverpool Street and they were celebrating the Holy Festival
Festival, which is a Hindu celebration of love, renewal, and the triumph of good over evil. And what makes this particularly fun is that it's also known as the Festival of Colours. And this is because one of the traditions is that you get to throw coloured powder all over each other. So we, we got to do that. And there was this big white room kind of outside the restaurant, and we got to just basically throw this coloured powder over one another, quite vivid colours as well. It was quite good fun. You know, there's not many jobs where you get to make a mess of your own boss, but I got to do that. And yeah, really enjoyed it. I didn't know whether things were getting me eyes or not, but it wasn't a problem because it was just kind of nice, soft, kind of flowery material and things. And you were a bit messy afterwards. You know, we each brought a change of clothes, obviously, but even so, we were still kind of had messy hair and everything. I mean, when I went into the um, gents' toilets to get changed in one of the cubicles, one of the guys in there saw me and sort of said, what the hell have you done to yourself? You know, not quite that wording but you know you get the idea she was just quite shocked to see me coming all covered in all this stuff but you know I, I didn't care what people thought even if you know people noticed my hair all messed up on the tube on the way home I just did not care you know I'm luckily I'm in a position where I can't even see if people are staring at me anyway but no one said anything and you're in London you see all sorts of weird and wonderful things up here sometimes so yeah it was nice to be able to do that but the uh, food we had with it was uh, lovely as well because after we had this half hour session we got to have then a nine course feast which sounds like a lot but um, obviously these were slightly smaller plates Cinnamon Kitchen was um, the same restaurant that Emily took me to for my birthday uh, back in August last year as well so we also had a nine course feast there too that was their Battersea branch as I say this one's in the uh, central London. But yeah, there was a nice selection of different dishes in this nine course feast. You know, one of the starters was a tandoori chicken leg tikka, for example. There was a lovely lamb rogan josh amongst the main courses. And there was a nice trio of desserts as well for the uh, final course. So yeah, I liked it all. I think the only thing I wasn't that struck on was the sea bream, or one of the starters, because there's lots of little bones in there and I'm not keen on bones in fish. The actual fish itself you know, was nice, but the bones kind of put you off a bit when, you know, when you have kind of bones and things like that. So yeah, it was really nice everyone was lovely you know we were obviously we weren't the only people who had been invited to this event we were all looked after really nicely by the PR company as you'd expect so yeah it was a great evening it was uh, slightly surreal in some ways because of all the paint throwing stuff but it was wonderful just to be able to let out the inner child and just chuck paint over each other and have a good laugh about it all and yeah, it's just one of the things I love about living in London, you know, and having this job as well. You know, I've had so many opportunities to do these weird and wonderful new things that I would never have had the chance to do before, you know, where I used to live and the life I used to lead. So I'm glad I'm kind of making the most of it and just getting these chances just to try new things, experience new things. It's one of the many things I love about this city. So, yeah, I'm glad I did that. And then the other meal I had with Emily was a much more normal affair. This was a nice dinner. Um, nothing posh, just a nice relaxed, comfortable environment with a nice view of the Thames. And this was at the Bingham River House in Richmond. And this is a new restaurant, which is run by award-winning chef Vanessa Marks. And the building is also a hotel as well. And this uh, restaurant is dog-friendly, so uh, Rosie, Emily's guide dog, was perfectly welcome in there with us. And we started off with uh, cocktails in the lounge, actually, to start with, where I had one called Dark and Stormy, which had some ginger beer in it, which was uh, very nice. And then before we started our meal in the dining room, we were invited to try some beer bread um, which is a South African style bread because uh, the chef has South African heritage and was very keen for us to try it and we uh, very much enjoyed it and then for the three course meal itself I had artichoke soup to start with again with some bread as well as a glass of uh, white wine and then the main course was a lovely succulent portion of sirloin steak I really enjoyed that I had some fries with that too and had a glass of red wine with it so that was really nice and filling it was a nice uh, generous sized portion and then there was a nice big slice of baked cheesecake with Horlicks caramel that I had for after so I was very happily stuffed after all that. It was genuinely really nice. So yeah, I was very nicely full up after that. And overall, it was just a very pleasant environment. It was comfortable, it was well lit. There was some very quiet ambient music in the background, but nothing that got anywhere near in the way of conversation. It was just kind of there as a nice backdrop, which was nice. And yeah, it just made for a lovely afternoon. So that I'll link to the review of, obviously in the description and in my blog, as with the review for the uh, Cinnamon Kitchen experience we had as well. And that's it. Those are the big things I want to mention for this month. So thank you very much for watching that. And I hope you enjoyed Enjoyed that and found it interesting as always. Um, in terms of TV, as I say, there's not much to mention really. I'm still enjoying The Last Leg and the extended editions of QI. There's a new series of Taskmaster as well, which is good. No one on there who I'm a particularly big fan of in their everyday work. Steve Pemberton's the one I know best from League of Gentlemen and I haven't watched that for ages. Um, but uh, the others I either don't know very well or at all, but it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, regardless of who's on the series, it's always good value. Um, so that's the great thing about that particular show, so I'm not worried about that. Gladiators has also finished, of course. I've spoken about that before. That's been a great uh, revival of that Saturday Night Entertainment show. I'm glad they didn't mess with it too much. And I'm very glad they're getting a second series as well, which is good. 
And Comic Relief I didn't bother with because there was nothing on there that interested me, much like previous years, really. There's not been much on there for a while. Um, yeah, it's a shame that Lenny Henry is retiring from presenting, but he is getting old now, and you know, it's nice to give way for kind of like the younger generation and all that. And he's still going to be working behind the scenes on it, so he's not leaving it entirely. And... Yeah, that's it, really. Um, there's one other thing I have watched that I'm kind of holding back till next month because I'm going to be watching some other kind of related things um, that would be nice to kind of group all together. It's not time sensitive, so I'm not worried about that. But uh, Live Aid's been taking up a lot of my time anyway. And I've started watching some of Ross Noble stuff I'm going to be reviewing as well. So, um, yeah, I've been watching plenty of things. Um, in terms of April, there is one theatre show in particular I'm going to see that I'm really looking forward to. It's one of, one of those that's been on my bucket list for a while. Um, and there's one other theatre-related thing I'm doing that's going to be really interesting, something I'm being paid to do, which is uh, going to be quite nice. I'm looking forward to that very much. And... Yeah, we'll just see what else the month brings, really. Um, there are things in mind that I want to do, things in mind that I'm going to watch as well. I have various things that I'm going to be watching uh, next month. So there'll be plenty to mention one way or another um, from my April favourites post. So, um, yeah, until then, I hope you have a good month, whatever you're getting up to. And, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for watching after all that. And, yeah, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe as per usual. And I will see you for another video very soon. Bye for now.